we will now uh, turn some time over to Lucy Williams, who is an assistant professor of political science here at BYU, who will uh, introduce our speaker, Lucy. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you, David, for being here with us today. I have to say, I think that um, <clears throat> putting together an introduction for David Schwendemann was the hardest academic assignment I have had all year, maybe in my whole career, because um, he has done some incredible things and it's, it's hard to condense this down to a manageable size. So I'm going to give you just a few highlights of what David Schwendemann has done during his career. Um, he received his law degree from the University of Utah and after passing the Utah bar exam began his professional career as an assistant Utah attorney general. Um, his work started with an exciting assignment. He worked on the death penalty litigation in the Gary Gilmore case um, and his, his career really hasn't slowed down since then. Um, during law school, Mr. Schwendemann was commissioned as an ensign in the US Naval Reserve. And shortly after his graduation, he was assigned to duty as a command judge advocate at the US Naval Station on Midway Island. He later moved to Guam where he worked as a defense counsel and trial counsel in military justice matters as the staff judge advocate for the commanding officer of the US Naval Air Station and as, the, uh, and as a special assistant US attorney. Um, because doing all of that while raising a family in Guam wasn't quite enough, he also took on work as a part-time associate in a law firm, um, beginning his firm work at 6 p.m. when his naval work uh, for the day had concluded. After many years of active service in the Naval Reserve, Mr. Schwendemann returned to Utah to join the Special Prosecutions Office in the Utah Attorney General's Office. Um, he later moved to the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Utah, where he handled a number of high profile cases involving violent crimes, homicide and drug investigation. Um, Mr. Schwendemann was assigned to help with security and counterterrorism planning for the 2002 Olympic Winter Games. And he was one of the US Attorney General's representative to major events and the 2000 Olymp in, at the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia. Um, he was also a member of the Utah Olympic Public Safety Command from 1998 to 2002. Um, in 2006, Mr. Schwendemann took a leave of absence without pay from the Department of Justice to accept an appointment as an international prosecutor in the Special Department for War Crimes of the, of the Prosecutor's Office of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, there he investigated and prosecuted war, war crimes that were committed during the 1992 to 1995 war in the former Yugoslavia. Um, in, no, in November 20, uh, 2007, he was appointed Deputy Chief Prosecutor of Bosnia and Herzegovina and head of the Special Department for War Crimes which meant he was responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the Special Department for War Crimes. Uh, beginning in 2009, he also took responsibility throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina for the forensic aspects of the location, recovery, examination, and identification of human remains from the war. Um, and he was responsible for creating and implementing policy that would um, get the state prosecutors involved in the excavation of, of mass graves in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, he supervised the recovery and digitization of over half a million pages of crime scene reports, autopsy reports, and other records related to the death and recovery of thousands of individuals who were murdered and left all over Bosnia and Herzegovina during the war in mass graves. Um, after returning from Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in late December 2009, he resumed his duties as an assistant United States Attorney General in the District of Utah. Um, he then completed several assignments to the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, where, among other things, he helped the Department of Justice uh, create programs of education designed to improve the knowledge and skills of Afghan prosecutors, law enforcement officers, and, and judges. Um, I could say a lot more, but in short, uh, David Schwendemann might be the most interesting man in the world. Um, my only regret today is that we don't have five hours to spend with him. Um, so I'll turn it over now to him. And again, David, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Lucy. And uh, hi, Sophie. Um, look, I'm very grateful to Professor Williams and Professor Benfell and the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I'm reminded of a poem Robert Frost published in 1928 when he was 54. I have a couple decades on him, but I think the sentiment's the same. When I was young, my teachers were the old. 
I gave up fire for form till I was cold. I suffered like a metal being cast. I went to school to age to learn the past. Now I am old, my teachers are the young. What can't be molded must be cracked and sprung. I strain at lessons fist, fit to start a suture. I go to school to youth to learn the future. I am, I assure you, suitably cracked and sprung and look forward to your questions and comments when we finish so I can learn a little bit about something of the future from you. When Professor Benfell wrote to me in July to invite me to spend time with you, he asked for a topic. In approaching that task, there could be no better advice than what I found in, another of, in the title of another Frost poem, neither out far nor in deep. When I began writing this in August, our domestic politics were not what they are today. Given what has occurred since August, and given the current state of our standing in the international community after four years of chaos, I am sure you agree I could not have settled on anything more ambitious, pretentious, or provocative, and perhaps consequential than the topic I chose. It is just as clear that we won't get into, into it today with the depth and breadth that it deserves. My purpose this afternoon is simply to get you to think, to question, and to offer some suggestions that might be of use to you now and in future. It is the mission of the Kennedy Center for International Studies to raise your global awareness and competency and to equip you with the international perspectives and tools you will need if you hope to promote intellectual, physical, spiritual well being throughout the world. I don't believe that can happen unless you genuinely and openly seek answers to the questions raised by the title. You each come to this with a personal history that flavors and influences who you are and what you bring to that effort. Uniquely, most of us on the call share certain foundational experiences that give us essential tools, not the least of which is languages and perspectives that informed and prepared me in my case, and will certainly prepare and inform each of you in the course of study you have chosen and the careers you will pursue. The stories, observations, and reflections I wanna share with you today come from the arc of my experience. Hopefully they will resonate with you and complement and supplement what you have already done and challenge you and inform what you will do in future. Now, for anyone who is not old enough or who hasn't figured out yet, figured it out yet, the title is the introduction to the Superman radio plays from the 1940s and 50s and the TV dramas from the 50s and early 60s. Superman, strange visitor from another world who came to earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal man, who disguised as Clark Kent mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, in the American way. Now, I find it fitting, given the times, that the show's writers disguised their strange visitor from another world, their Superman, whom they endowed with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, as a reporter for the Daily Planet, a great metropolitan newspaper. There is considerable irony in that, I think. I have been reported on for much of my professional life, both here and especially overseas in the last decade. Though my relations with reporters haven't been as smooth as I would have liked sometimes, I profoundly respect and, and immensely admire the journalists I've gotten to know for their skill, for their brilliance and their mastery of the craft for their bravery and creativity getting in and out of tight spots, places diplomats were not allowed to go, and even the military was reluctant to set foot in, and for the most part, for their objectivity and their courage and their commitment to tell truth to power. Much of what I did in Bosnia, Brussels, and The Hague would not have happened, would not have been possible if it wasn't for the valiant work of intrepid reporters who risked it all in dangerous places to get the facts and report on what they saw. Among other things, 
their work preserved evidence that would otherwise have been lost. They brought the plight of desperate people to the attention of the world as they do now with much greater immediacy, but also in the face of greater risk. I've gotten to know journalists, international and domestic, who reported from Sarajevo during the worst years of the conflict in Bosnia, who reported from Afghanistan when it meant dodging death to do it, and who risked their lives in Kosovo, Bosnia, Bangladesh, Syria, and the left bank to make us aware, to write the story of, and to bring us the images of atrocity that made the world take notice and act. And I should add, none of them let me get away with anything. In your choice of a career, you could do worse than become a journalist, though it will likely require significant personal sacrifice if you do. Your life will not be a normal or routine one if that is how you choose to spend your life. Now, the title. The punctuation I chose is deliberate and important. Truth, period. We all assume, I think, that truth should be something that is relatively settled. Thus, the period. But that assumption has been severely challenged in the last few years. We have been forced to wrestle with what we think of truth and of fact and the relationship of fact and truth in public life. Justice, exclamation point. Almost every day we hear someone use the word justice in some way, in the media, on social media, on the street, in protest, counter protests, in political campaigns, and even in our ordinary, often uncomfortable conversations with family, friends, former friends, colleagues, and former colleagues. Racial justice, access to justice, criminal justice, economic justice, environmental justice, social justice. All of this in a time of heightened anxiety, even dread because of a deadly virus, growing inequality, the use of excessive force by some in law enforcement, <clears throat> racial division, and the economic consequences of the pandemic. Not to mention immigration and the plight of minority and refugee communities in China, Tibet, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Sudan, Palestine, and Syria, just to name a few of the headline crises of the day. Crises bound and unbound by borders, crises that have real and far-reaching impact on both those affected and the international community at large. I heard it nearly every day from victims, potential targets of our investigation, the accused in our cases, advocates, politicians, diplomats, and academics who spoke to me about or commented on the work I was doing in Bosnia and during my time in Brussels and The Hague, not always kindly. All those people demanded I do justice. I heard the word spoken almost, in, almost always in a very emphatic way. Demands for justice, laments for justice, justice denied or delayed, threats to extract justice, promises of justice, proud announcements that justice had been served or justice had been done. In Bosnia, it was used in ways that deliberately or inadvertently created expectations, sometimes desperate, always provocative, at times explosive. Thus the exclamation point. The idea of justice was commonly exploited for political advantage, often dramatically and almost always with more volume than substance. Again, the exclamation point. But our question today, when I hope to get to, is what does justice mean practically for people who have suffered terribly, who genuinely yearn for something to happen, for someone to do something that will relieve their pain and compensate them for what was taken from them, or address their anxiety and grievances? To victims and survivors, perpetrators, diplomats, peacekeepers, investigators, prosecutors, judges, and aggrieved communities and the entrepreneurs of misery who seek to manipulate victims and survivors' pain and perpetrators' grievances for their own interest out of greed or for political, social, or religious power. And finally, the American way, question mark. Is there an American way? When you go out to promote intellectual, physical, spiritual well-being throughout the world, 
it will be some version of the American way that you will be exporting, whether you acknowledge it or not. What the people you encounter think is the American way will largely be what they see you do, what they hear you say, and what they think of you personally. It will also be what they have read or heard or seen on the internet, in social media, what they've, reported, what they've seen reported on television or read in the media, our media and others less sympathetic to us, and what they have been led to believe by leaders and influencers who are threatened by your presence and your involvement in their world. My experience tells me that you will need to be humble and smart and you will need a very durable ego. Now, my question to all of you is, are you ready for that? Well, let's start with truth. To begin, I want to tell you about someone who made a lasting impression on me, though I don't know her name. As best I know, she is nameless. One of my responsibilities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as Lucy indicated, involved the forensic side of the work that was done to locate and excavate graves. It required I help supervise the exhumation of those found in the graves and to do what I could to give them names. My part of the job was to preserve the forensic value of the remains of those buried in the graves, to collect and secure what was found with them and record as best we could the circumstances of graves so the results of the work could be used to investigate and prosecute, prosecute those responsible for the crimes uncovered with them. As best we could, I also wanted to reunite the dead with their survivors and loved ones to help them turn the page on a terrible, unforgettable chapter in their lives so that they could live with the past but not be condemned to forever live in it, made to suffer again each day the haunting effects of not knowing. In May 2009, I was asked to take responsibility for the remains and the records and artifacts associated with the recovery of about 800 people. All of this was stored in a warehouse in Northwest Bosnia, which had only recently been brought to the attention of the International Commission on Missing Persons, the ICMP. The warehouse was neglected for years before it was brought to the attention of the ICMP by organizations representing survivors who lost family members and acquaintances in the area during the 1992 to 95 war in the former Yugoslavia. Experts from the ICMP went into the warehouse, organized what they found, reassociated what they could, that is sorted the skeletal remains and reassembled them according to protocols and the science they had to work with. And by using advanced forensic and DNA science and technology, began trying to identify who the people were who were stacked in the racks and laid out on the floor of what was now essentially a morgue. The ICMP scientists and technicians were doing the tedious work of trying to figure out where the people in the graves came from and what happened to them. To among other things, make the cause and manner of death determinations required by law. Since I worked with the ICMP in other situations and because I had legal authority to take custody of the remains for forensic purposes, and I had responsibility to collect the documents and artifacts, potential evidence, that is clothing, personal possessions, bullets, cartridges, ligatures, blindfolds, and other items of potential forensic value, the, the, the items that were associated with the remains. The ICMP was eager to have me visit the building to see for myself what they found, assess what they were doing, and assume responsibility and make arrangements for the disposition of what was there. After spending time inspecting the site, one of the anthropologists led me to a plastic sheet in one of the rows of remains in the, in the warehouse. Carefully arranged there was the partial skeleton of a small person, just ribs, parts of leg and arm bones, including a femur, some vertebra, a scapula, and most importantly, the hyoid bone. The story of this small person illustrates the kind of truth I am most familiar with in the work I've gotten to do. Observable, objectively accessible, reasonably indisputable, 
provable facts, discoverable, objective, provable, reasonably indisputable context within which, within which to place the facts to make sense of them for my purposes as a criminal investigator and prosecutor. Reasonably objective and neutral analysis of the facts and context based on common sense, education, experience, training, and the proper application of reliable science, technology, or expertise done to help me as an investigator and prosecutor make well-informed, intelligent, independent, neutral, objective, and fair decisions regarding whether crimes were committed and by whom and whether I can prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to a properly informed and instructed trier of fact. This kind of truth is essential before outcomes that hope to be legitimate and perceived as legitimate by those they affect can be achieved. Now, it is a fact that the bones of this small person were recovered from a pit found near a mosque in a village in Northwest Bosnia. It is a fact that the pit was purposely dug and that it contained the remains of many people thrown together, old and young, male and female, none of whom were prepared for burial according to custom. It is a fact that the village was attacked by Bosnian Serb paramilitaries sometime around the beginning of the conflict in 1992. It is a fact that no disease, famine, pestilence, natural disaster or other cause explains why so many people were buried together where they were, when they were and the way they were. It is a fact that out of the jumble of bones recovered from the pit, experienced people from the ICMP using proven reliable DNA science, technology, and expertise were able to separate this person's bones from the others and put as much of this small person back together as they could. The process told them that the remains I was looking at all belong to the same person. It is a fact that by properly applying generally accepted principles of a relevant scientific discipline, in this case, forensic osteology, that is bone science, by looking at the length, shape, and development of the femur, the, ICMPS, the ICMP experts determined the remains were those of a young girl who was probably about 14 years old at the time of her death. It is a fact that there was a deep upward cut from left to right on her hyoid bone, the bone in the front of her neck just below her chin and above her larynx. The ICMP forensic pathologists know from training and experience that the hyoid bone is a bone often scored or cut when a person's throat is cut. Their experience with violent death told them with some certainty that deep left to right upward cut on the young girl's hyoid bone was caused by someone who held her close from behind while her throat was cut with a sharp edged instrument, probably a knife that was wielded in the assailant's right hand. Their training and experience permitted them to conclude based on the facts that the cause, the what, of the 14-year-old's death was a deep fatal wound to the throat. The physical evidence allowed them to determine with reasonable certainty that what was done to the young girl was the deliberate act of another human being. The manner, the how of death was homicide. What was done to her was intensely personal and very intimate. But the context tells us that the others buried with her were also deliberately killed, victims of homicide. Context tells us something even more significant, that hers and theirs were not ordinary homicide. She was murdered, they were murdered, during a systematic attack carried out by Bosnian Serb military or paramilitaries against the civilian, in this case, Muslim population of her village. They were the victims, are the victims of a crime against humanity. And because the, member, because the murders of innocent civilians, non-combatants in international or non-international armed conflict, essentially civil war, and the war in Bosnia had elements of both, because they violate common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, they were, they are victim, war crime victims as well. 
Now this is our 14 year old's truth. No expert could give me the name of the person who killed her. I was left to investigate further to try to determine which units were operating in the area around the time she was murdered, which units took part in the attack on her village, who belonged to those units, who did the actual killing during the uh, operation, who wielded the knife that killed our 14 year old, who commanded the units and the people involved, who ordered the operations and the murders, who carried out the, the orders, or and who in command knew there would be civilians killed in this way or that it was likely they would be killed and did nothing to stop it or found out about the murders afterward and failed to do what was necessary and possible to hold those responsible to account. This is also her truth, far too incomplete until I made every effort to try to uncover it, prosecute it, and see those responsible properly punished. But what about justice for our 14 year old and all those like her who perished in similar ways during the war in Bosnia, for those who perished in the Holocaust, for those who were raped, tortured, displaced, and murdered in Kosovo, in Rwanda, in, in Myanmar, and in the Sudan. Uncovering truth by the means I've discussed and otherwise, a complicated, tedious, frustrating, discouraging, protracted, painful, emotional, and physical undertaking is necessary before we can begin to unpack the second word in my title, justice, notwithstanding the exclamation point. Our 14 year old is likely interred in one of the ossuaries that have since been created for the unidentified and nameless of the war, but she is not forgotten. No data existed in the extensive ICMP databases to connect her DNA with the DNA of any victim or survivor of the attack or to anyone else, but she is not forgotten. Forgetting her, forgetting others from whom so much is taken, including in her case a future, and simply moving on, hoping that over time all will be forgotten and forgiven without an accounting is just not possible. And in fact, it does not happen. Uh, Sheikh Sadi, a 14th century Afghan or Persian poet, left this wisdom for us. The human race is made up of men, all created from the one source. If one man feel pain, the others from the same source cannot be indifferent to it. You who are unmoved by others' suffering are not entitled to the name of man. In Proverbs, Solomon leaves us with this admonition to act to do what is in us to address the plight of our 14 year old and others like her, to rescue her from, from it if it's within our power. If you, should, if you showed yourself slack in time of trouble, wanting in power, if you refrained from rescuing those taken off to death, those condemned to slaughter, if you say we knew nothing of it, surely he who fathoms hearts will discern the truth he who watches over your life will know it, and he will pay each man as he deserves. Seeking justice in cases like our 14 year olds is what keeps us focused on preventing atrocity, keeps us from becoming indifferent, goads us to rescue those taken off to death, condemned to slaughter, shames us for excusing our indifference by claiming we knew nothing of it, of keeping faith with what we know in our hearts to be true, that is that, but for fortune, we too could be victims and survivors and unfortunately perpetrators and enablers as well. The work I got to do in Bosnia, in Afghanistan, in Brussels and The Hague taught me to be very careful about and openly skeptical of how this powerful word was being used. The idea was not foreign to me in my work as a domestic prosecutor here in Utah and elsewhere, but as an international prosecutor, I became preoccupied with this idea of justice, not as an intellectual exercise, but out of practical necessity. As I noted earlier, the word justice is often spoken in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Those who used it was often spoken in Bosnia. Those who used it in conversations about war crimes when I was there often talked around and through one another, consciously carelessly, but also deliberately in some cases. 
In Bosnia, I did not have the luxury of being careless, nor could I simply ignore the deliberate exploitation of the word. I learned I had to avoid using the word to keep from creating unreasonable expectations that I knew I could not meet, a result that would almost certainly compromise me and the outcomes I was trying to achieve. In Bosnia, the international community often used the word cynically. Victims and survivors of, war, of the war were promised justice by those who intervened as part of their efforts to stop the fighting, used simply to achieve what they believed were desirable political objectives. The promises they made were loud, but were short on substance, and more often than not were unrealistic and unattainable. People who purported to represent the interests of victims and survivors often made similarly cynical and self-serving demands for justice that were just as loud, unrealistic, and unattainable. They consciously and unconsciously raised expectations that threatened to compromise meaningful efforts to hold accountable those responsible for horrific violence. The same thing happens in many other places besides those I experienced in Syria, Myanmar, Palestine, and in Minneapolis, Atlanta, Kenosha, and Louisville, for example. The role of criminal investigation and prosecution in meeting the kinds of expectations I was dealing with in Bosnia and in my work on Kosovo and in Afghanistan is commonly misunderstood, particularly those by those bent on achieving the pragmatic resolution of a conflict regardless of its impact on accountability for atrocities. Criminal prosecution rarely meets the expectations of many because in my experience, few victims and few entrepreneurs of the narratives that grow out of violence, especially violent acts that receive immediate and widespread attention, few are, few are prepared to fully embrace as legitimate a process that assumes the innocence of the accused. In even the most ordinary criminal case, those who suffered personally, who know what happened because they experienced it, often confuse legal guilt with what they believe is obvious. That is that terrible things happen. I was hurt and someone needs to be punished. It's important, I think, to look at what the self-aware prosecutor will tell you about what she can do. All she can do who is hold an individual accountable for his or her own conduct. And that must be done on evidence that is reliable, available, admissible according to generally accepted standards and convincing. Her decision to charge someone with a crime must be made independently, without improper influence, impartially to the extent that is possible, unaffected by bias or prejudice, including confirmation bias. Her decision must be colorblind. That is, she can't let white, blue, brown, black, or any other color influence how she treats an accused or victims or anyone else affected by her decision. Her decisions must be religiously and culturally neutral. Any decision she makes must be based on the best information available to her. On the best educated, objective and neutral analysis of that information, and according to her best, most well-informed objective assessment of the viability of her case, including an assessment, a reasonable assessment of whether, of whether she has or can acquire the resources necessary to prosecute her case. To the extent possible and appropriate, she must be transparent, but she must always be truthful. She must effectively and credibly let the general public but especially those who are affected by her decision, know what she decided and why and how she made her decisions. It all must be done in a reasonably swift way, keeping in mind that haste is no friend of justice, regardless what the word is understood to mean. Whether all this achieves justice is often beyond her control, but it is vital that the authority and responsibility for holding people accountable be set in the hands of people that are independent and are governed by laws, rules, and norms generally accepted as legitimate. This so that the outcomes obtained are in fact substantively and procedurally legitimate, but even more importantly, are perceived as legitimate by those affected by them. They will not be accepted and enforceable otherwise. 
I submit there is a greater lesson for us in the story of the 14 year old in Sansky Most. That is that justice, whatever else it might mean, however it is achieved, ought to be first thought of in terms of human dignity. <clears throat> now, dignity, I'll forego a long definition of dignity for you, but I think Sheikh Sadi and the author of Proverbs got it right, that dignity involves fundamental respect for people because they are human beings. <clears throat> Essentially, their entitlement to live and live unmolested, free of violence inflicted on, on them by others, to having to make decisions and choices, to be responsible and held accountable for those choices, to live in a community from which she takes support and sustenance and to which she gives same, to realize her potential to have hope, to believe as he or she does, chooses, or not to believe as he chooses without being molested because of those beliefs, to participate in her governance, to have a meaningful say in who she gives the authority to govern to and in how she is to be governed and to hold those who govern accountable for the way they, they discharge that trust. Now, let me finish with my, my last part, the last part of the title, The American Way, question mark. In October, in what may have been a COVID-19 inspired, if not induced, ramble on Twitter, Senator Lee expressed the view that the Constitution establishes a constitutional republic, not a democracy, implying that the two are mutually exclusive. Around 7.35 p.m. on October 7, he wrote, we are not, he wrote, we are not a democracy. Later after midnight, he wrote, democracy isn't the objective, liberty, peace, and prosperity are. We want the human condition to flourish. Ranked democracy can thwart that. It was James Madison who deliberately conflated democracy and republic in Federalist 10 where he argued for the value of popular participatory government, democracy, while proposing a scheme for governing a republic that limits the damage pure democracy might do to the common good. The terms, one from the Greek democracy and the other from the Latin republic mean virtually the same thing and have been used interchangeably since the constitution was written. Calling it rank democracy does it no useful service. In one way or another, whether you agree with Senator Lee, whether you see it as I do, or you think of it some other way, you will likely be called upon to answer the questions his remarks raise if in future you find yourself talking to and working with people somewhere else in the world. I have had to answer these questions or try to answer them everywhere I've lived and worked since I began traveling overseas for the Department of Justice with the Inspector General and in the State Department as a senior foreign service officer over a period of almost two decades. Here's what that experience and the luxury, I, the luxury I've had lately of reflecting on that experience leads me to think. Our form of popular democracy, a democracy representative in practice, or our form of popular government, a democracy representative in practice, is an ambitious, constantly involving, magnificent experiment flawed in ways, generally successful and worth keeping. It may be true that it is better than anything else that's been tried, at least we like to think so. The framers who gathered in convention in Philadelphia in 1787 did, did not aspire to create a city on the hill. They came together to solve the conceptual and very practical problems of governing that were being aggravated by weak articles of confederation to address the severe financial crisis plugging the new independent colonies, to secure and ensure the survival of what they had achieved in the bloody fight with an enormously powerful empire that sought and continued to seek to crush them, to protect themselves against a world that was not especially welcoming, to give life to their enlightened liberal aspirations and ambitions, to protect their own interests, and to take care of the bread and butter issues of their constituents and of those yet unborn. They made that clear in the preamble they wrote, that in the preamble they wrote, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, there's that word again, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare 
and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. These were tough, pragmatic, politically astute, brave, educated, persistent, experienced, and brilliant men, men in many ways, flawed too in many ways. Some were theists, some were religious, though not all were churchgoers. All had risked their lives to be where they and the fledgling nation were, and each was willing to risk more, though still protective of their own interest and the interest of those that they believed they represented. They were businessmen, soldiers, farmers, planters, slave owners, lawyers, churchmen. There, even was, a, there was even a printer among them. We the people, of course, did not mean what we understand the phrase to mean today. Many of the framers were not sympathetic to anything that were encountered to prevailing views of race and slavery. Others were ambivalent. Those who did care gave, a, gave away in, in compromise. Slaves were property to be counted only as their numbers affected taxation and the count for representation in the House of Representatives, and then only as the equivalent of three fifths of a human being. The framers did not consider Native Americans worth counting at all unless they were taxed. In less than 50 years, Native Americans would be driven off their lands, the destruction of their culture would be well underway, and their physical eradication from the West would become national policy. Not a woman was among those who gathered in Philadelphia, nor was, this, nor was it contemplated by anyone to the, in the convention that women would vote or otherwise participate in the institutions they were creating. Our history is one of collectively and not so collectively, striving, competing, succeeding, and failing to, rec to correct what was overlooked or deliberately done by the framers to better realize the potential for achieving and protecting the dignity of those affected by what they set in motion. The framers came to the convention with competing visions of what the United States ought to look like and ought to act like, competing visions that have yet to be fully resolved. But despite the flaws, the genius of what they accomplished in 1787 endures. I believe it, it succeeds because we pull together when we need to, when we are led by selfless, smart, tough, remarkable, and obstinate leaders who rise to the challenge in times of crisis, even those of our own making. Because we generally respect norms and customs that evolved largely through trial and error over the two and a half centuries since Philadelphia to guide the institutions created in 1787 in ways that help them survive and adapt. Because we have proven over time that we can change when we must and we can accept and adapt to change that was foreseen and to change that could not have been envisioned in Philadelphia. It also endures because of the service and commitment of those who honor their oath to protect and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic, as you already have if you have served and as you will when you go out into the world in future. I think what they did and what we've inherited doesn't just survive, it thrives in large part because of the triumph of the better angels of our nature that Lincoln alluded to in his first inaugural in 1861. An inaugural that was given in a dark, very dark time on the eve of the greatest constitutional crisis in our nation's history and our bloodiest war when we were literally at the precipice. Though Lincoln did not elaborate, elaborate I believe the better nature, the angels of our nature include, to name just a few, decency, public and private, genuine decency, goodwill in public and private life, respectable give and take in service to the common good, honesty, public and private, being honest doesn't mean you're weak, respect, public and private, not just tolerance, being respectful doesn't mean you're weak either, empathy, Having empathy certainly doesn't mean you're weak. Optimism, realistic, robust optimism. Being optimi optim optimistic doesn't mean you avoid the truth or deny real reality. Intelligence, demonstrated, not just claimed. Competence, true mastery. Strength, necessary strength to be built and used appropriately and wisely to achieve and defend the common good and security of all. Perseverance, courage, 
moral courage and physical courage, commitment to ensuring and protecting human dignity, integrity, public and private, accepting responsibility, acknowledging mistakes and defeats with grace, learning from mistakes and failures, correcting what can be corrected, moving on. Community, inclusive community, diverse community, welcoming community, communities of caring, commitment to the common good, more we than they, and selflessness and service in public and private life, more us and less me and I. Committing to things larger than oneself, giving of oneself without consideration of return or reward. Being selfless is not weakness. It certainly doesn't make you, um, it certainly doesn't make you weak. In the past, we have been known for, respected for, and defined by our commitment to and respect for the rule of law, our commitment to and respect for the competence, neutrality, and independence of the court, our commitment to and respect for the institutions created in 1787 as they have evolved to govern for the common good and to the norms and customs that have helped them thrive, commitment to perfecting them for the common good, to changing them wisely when the times and circumstances require it for the common good, our commitment to universal suffrage, our commitment to and respect for the peaceful, generous, and cooperative transfer of power for the common good, our commitment to education, to a fully informed citizenry, our commitment to and respect for the health and well being of all, our commitment to and respect for a vigorous free press, and our commitment to and respect for peaceful assembly and protest. These are among the most important values, norms, and customs that make us who we are, that comprise in part at least my vision of the American way. Lucy, if we're exceptional, this is what makes us so. In large measure, it, 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 it will be what you will be exporting. Now, I've tried in a simple, certainly naive way to unpack some ideas that I believe are essential to how we think about ourselves, how we are governed, and what we take with us out into the world in services envisioned by the Kennedy Center. You may not agree with all or even anything I say, but here is what I want to leave you with to think about, to act on. I propose that truth is knowable despite what has been said and done for the last several years. I propose that human dignity is one of those truths that is knowable. I propose that that truth is an essential precursor to achieving justice. And I propose that there is an American way that will always be evolving, but it is fundamentally anchored by certain values, norms, and customs, including among them a commitment to human dignity that are worth preserving and perhaps taking to the world. The year of exporting the American way to developed and undeveloped nations who we aspire to make or keep as allies, or at least to neutralize for our security or to win over or restructure to advance our own prosperity may be over, at least as I have known and experienced it. When it comes to trying to impose our brand of democracy on others or insisting that our way of doing things is superior to all others, our claim to being exceptional has been severely damaged. But perhaps that is for the best. Where we find ourselves now forces us, among other things, to rethink how we work with and compete with former allies, including the EU, and those who are part of important security and economic alliances like NATO and ASEAN, as well as how we deal with and compete in the same world as our adversaries, as they are forced to rethink how they deal with us in future. I am grateful and encouraged and excited that each of you will be part of all of that. It will be for you, as, as, it, as it has been for me, a worthy way of spending your life, not just a way of making a living. You wouldn't be listening now if you didn't think the same way I do, and if you didn't already have the basic tools, including attitude, to make a difference, and if you weren't willing to learn more and become better prepared to make the world and the lives of the people in it better for your efforts. Finally, in a time when despair, anger, grievance and division are promoted and deliberately exploited. I say there is no future in despair, anger, grievance and division. There is no future in surrender or resignation. There can't be for you 
if you're going to keep faith with the mission of the Kennedy Center. I believe there is no substitute now for optimism, that there is a future for optimism. I believe if you're going to pick a course, choose one with the future and act in capital letters. I leave you as I began with a poem. This one has served me well my entire professional life. It was written by an Alexandrine Greek, Constantine Cavafy, at the beginning of the 20th century. For certain people, there comes a day when they are called upon to say the great yes or the great no. It's clear at once who has the yes within him at the ready, which he will say as he advances in honor in greater self-belief. He who refuses has no second thoughts. Asked again, he would repeat the no. And nonetheless, that no, so right, defeats him all his life. So prepare, seek out opportunity, and be ready with the great yes when you're called upon to say it. So I, I hope I've left just a little bit of time to answer some of the questions you might have if, if you do. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, David, we would, you know, I'm sure if we were in person, we would have uh, a lot of applause here. Um, <laughs> that was really uh, terrific, uh, very uh, thoughtful and, and lots of things to, um, you know, to think about and, and try to digest. And um, I, I will just say one of the things that I find uh, found very moving was the, the optimism that you conclude not only not only conclude with but encourage us to adopt in in a uh, in a time that right often would lead us to despair uh, at times. Um, but let me let me maybe start things off by by just asking a question um, about optimism and related to one of your assertions right about truth that truth is knowable and. Um, what what do you do in an age when truth itself seems to become polarized, right? You have, and, and individuals, we often, we don't have common authorities oftentimes that, that adjudicate between those notions. Do you have any suggestions about um, maintaining that belief or encouraging other people to Sort of adopt that belief in objective truth that you were that you were passionately uh, advocating for. Yeah, and I think um, it's a little bit easy for me to talk about the kind of truth that I was referring to in the lecture, uh, and that is ground truth in a criminal investigation or prosecution, because if after I've done all I can to uncover facts and analyze them and assess them the way I described it. I determine that there's nothing there. I move on. Um, truth in the uh, truth in a larger sense, like what you're talking about, Stan, um, is not so easy. Um, and the facts sometimes are not so easy. Um, we have different ways of going about us uh, and determining the facts. I mean, Lucy worked for Scott. Trial courts deal with facts. They apply the law to the facts. They come up with decisions. They make, um, they find people guilty. They render people liable. They affix costs and all kinds of things. It goes on to an appellate court, like the one Lucy worked with or worked on in the 10th circuit. And they assess those things and they make decisions. Well, there is a common arbiter for that. And that is the courts that make the original decisions in the appellate courts that see whether or not those original decisions work. And there's a Supreme Court, which is a little more political, but not as political as people have been making it out to be in the last little while. You have honest, decent people with ideas, of course, but also with the restrictions that the law and the process impose on them. So there is a common arbiter. In political truth, that's not the case necessarily. Um, and it's tough, it's hard, particularly when a version of what someone says is the truth is weaponized for one, re for one thing or another, for one purpose or another. So I don't know if I have an answer for you there. All I can say is that I do believe truly in optimism and that is in the end, 
things tend to sort themselves out, but not by themselves. If you don't really get involved and do your best to, again, embody those values that I described as the better angels of our nature, if you're not honest, if you don't have integrity, if you don't recognize the independence of these bodies that we've created, if you don't agree that they need to be changed sometimes to better work for the common good, if you don't have fundamental belief in those things, I think you've got real trouble. But I do believe the people like those on this call, like others that I know, I believe the majority are committed to those values and those values will win out. And that will reflect in how we see what we believe to be truth, uh, what we know is fact and the results. Oh, thank Noah, you. you, you were, yeah. yeah. No, you were a missionary in Yugoslavia, where? No, I, they had to type that out, so I, I can't just talk to him. Well, they, yeah, I don't know if uh, if he's, now that we're at one o'clock, he may have had to leave uh, for a class or something. But yeah, that's that, that's great. Um, let, me, let me just, we can finish with this. Uh, a question from Liz. Um, who says, you know, how, how that optimism, again, very inspiring, especially considering the atrocities that you have dealt with and worked with that would seem, she says, to it would leave some people to be cynical about human nature and what we can achieve. How, how did you work to maintain your optimism in the face of that kind of evidence of human atrocity? Well, and that I wasn't always that way. Um, it didn't start off that way. A few experiences I had at the beginning of my time in Bosnia, and I think I've talked to folks when Lucy was around about this, uh, they crushed me. I mean, it crushed me. Um, I'd been doing violent crime, terrible stuff, the LeBaron cases, that sort of thing for a long time. Uh, and I thought I was pretty hard bitten. I got to Bosnia in one of my first experiences with, with a group of women who had lost everything in a place called Chinicha. And when they began to talk to me and push photographs of their kids and their husbands and their uncles and brothers at me um, and demanding that I do something, people that had cried themselves dry, uh, it, it really had an effect on me. And I walked out, walked down the hallway with my Serb language assistant, Vanya, who was also in tears and said, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I've signed up for three years. I don't know about this. Uh, this is not what I was prepared for. And she only looked at me and said very kindly, just get ready for it. You'll get there. And I think over time, I, I think I realized that as terrible as these things were, as bad as it was to stand in the mass graves, which I did on, on occasion, to have the smell and the feel and the sense that was there, I realized that being cynical despairing, wasn't doing any good. Um, it wasn't gonna help me, certainly wasn't gonna get my job done. And as I reflected despair, if I respl reflected despair and cynicism, I wasn't gonna affect or help any of the people that had lost so much. So though I couldn't be simple about it and I couldn't be soft about it, I couldn't tell them things that I knew were just stupid. Um, I knew that I had to reflect some optimism um, because in partly they were looking at, in part they were looking at me for that. But it had to be honest optimism. It couldn't be posing, it couldn't be fake. It had to be authentic. You had to you had to live through it in order to become genuine about it. 